Welcome to Voices, a podcast from the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Here, we're seeking to elevate the range of perspectives on the role of business in the world and in people's everyday lives. Hello, I'm John Morrison. I'm the CEO of the Institute for Human Rights and Business, IHRB, and it's with great pleasure that I'm here chatting with our new chair of our International Advisory Council, Margot Wallström. Margot, you're not quite with me in the UK. Uh, tell, tell everybody where you, you are at the moment. Hello there, John, and thank you very much for inviting me to this. And uh, I am next to the biggest lake in Sweden, Lake Vänern, uh, where I live with my family and where I have self-isolated for quite some time now. <laughs> Uh, but I have a nice view and I'm in the middle of uh, uh, the, the forest. Beautiful. Yes. And it's just, uh, we're recording this, it's autumn. And we were talking about the, the leaves falling from the deciduous trees and uh, the, the bees, the bees, uh, you've given them uh, sugared water, I believe, to help them through the winter. <laughs> well, we are lucky enough to um, live in a place where we can keep um, a couple of beehives and we also have chickens. So we now have 15 chickens and uh, not yet producing any eggs, but we are waiting for that. Uh, so I'm, I'm lucky to have uh, such a varied uh, daily routine that includes feeding chickens. <laughs> Well, we're, we're welcoming you back to our International Advisory Council. You were a member before, um, and um, uh, you were called away uh, by the Swedish government to do something there, I believe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you're back, um, and you, you've willingly um, taken the role of chair. Um, our previous chairs, I think, uh, uh, people know, but Mary Robinson was our founding chair, and then Professor John Ruggie was, 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 then came afterwards. So we're very pleased to have you third in that succession. But obviously, um, you 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 have done many many things in your career. Um, elected uh, to the Swedish Parliament at the age of 25, uh, you were Minister for Consumer Affairs, Women, Youth, and uh, Churches, I believe, as well. EU uh, Commissioner for the, for the Environment uh, for five years, and then you were first Vice President of the European Commission for six years from 2004 to 2010, leading on institutional relations and communications. Um, then for the UN, Special Representative of Sexual Violence in Conflict, and then most recently as the Swedish Minister for Foreign Affairs from 2014 to 2019. Now, in all of that experience, a lot of it for, for governments at the highest level for the UN, you must have interacted with business and business leaders many, many times. Are you left with a, an, a positive or a negative impression? What's the overriding impression of business you have from a societal perspective after all those interactions? Well, thank you, John. And first of all, thank you very much for welcoming me back to uh, IHRB and um, uh, this is uh, big shoes to uh, to fill uh, those of uh, both uh, John Ruggie and uh, and of course Mary Robinson so I'm a bit nervous but at the same time um, I enjoyed it very much uh, the short time that I um, already spent uh, uh, with you and for you um, and I have the highest respect for for um, everything that, that you are, are doing. And I think it's absolutely right and timely to come back to, to this, to ensure um, and, and work for the defense of, of human rights, uh, including with business. You know, I'm a, I'm a Swedish social democrat. So we have always um, been able to, uh, I think, uh, work um, also ideologically and practically in a way that we balance the interests of business because we need business to create jobs. Um, and all my contacts have, have been with, with, I would say, constructive and, and wise uh, business leaders. And I think also small and medium-sized businesses are very, very important in, in our society. But uh, we can also see, unfortunately, how 
in today's world, uh, so many people are exploited and, and abused uh, on, on the labor market and, and denied their, their human rights. So I think we still have uh, so much more to do. So when, when only money uh, is allowed to, to take over, uh, I think that we run a, a big risk of, of seeing also the suppression of, of human rights. So there's a lot more to, to do. But I, I mean, we, we are dependent on both big and small businesses and, uh, and we need to create a good climate for, for, for business and for production and for services and everything that they uh, contribute to society uh, with. Uh, but we also have to make sure that we have a, a, a good um, defense for, for workers' rights and uh, the right to belong to a labor union and, and what have you, trade union. So this is, uh, uh, this is still very uh, valid and uh, our work is important. Yeah, absolutely. So as we're sitting here now, COVID is making something of a comeback in our parts of the world um, as we enter a winter. And political leaders in many places are talking about building back better. We have the US elections only two weeks away. It's a slogan there. Um, some people have commented that um, um, some of the world's leaders slowest to respond to the data around COVID have been male politicians. Some people have commented that female politicians have been quicker and uh, to, to more responsible in their reaction. Um, it is clear that some of the workers, so you mentioned workers um, at the front line of this fight against COVID, whether it be in the health services and the care homes in supermarkets and supply chains are women, right? And you're famous for your feminist foreign policy, Margot, and, and, the, and, and, and your role as a, as a, as a, as a, as a leader. How, do you look at the COVID issue and the COVID response through the lens of gender or, or not? Yeah, you have to do that. It's, it's absolutely clear that this um, pandemic um, actually discriminates. In one way, it discriminates against men, because at least from the beginning, I'm not sure what science and our experience tells us now, but at least initially, it affected men more than women. And of course, also it, there was an age discrimination. So more older people um, uh, caught this disease uh, um, uh, more often. And I think that we have to realize that, that many of those most affected on a labor market were women because it was the service jobs and there's a majority of women also working in the healthcare sector and, and et cetera, et cetera. And those that take care of, of the elderly, uh, but also in the homes where we actually saw the level of, uh, of uh, abuse and, and violence against women going up uh, enormously, uh, almost everywhere in, in the world. And this is just crazy that women have to go through this. They are then uh, sort of trapped in a way. They need to be home, they are isolated, and that's the, to them the most dangerous place. So you have to look at it also with a gender lens on. Um, but, um, and I think that this has taken an enormous toll, of course, on, on our economy, uh, on our health uh, systems and, and everything you can think of, but um, it will also have to um, lead to a reflection about uh, um, gender uh, issues and exactly, first of all, how do we stop violence against women? And, and, and unfortunately, it, children is also part of. of and there's been a spike. Does the data show an increased violence uh, because of the lockdown? Is, is the data that supports that? Well, yeah, yeah. I, I think that we, I've seen those reports about the violence against women that that has uh, uh, definitely increased. There are more cases, um, which is um, so sad and and very um, uh, counterproductive. Also, if we want women to enter into the workforce and if we want uh, women to 
to, to, to play fully their role in, in society. And they, have, they, are, they also have more precarious jobs. And, uh, and this is uh, where I think we have a, a role to play. I immediately uh, actually joined a, a group of, of international leaders and women who have held jobs both within the UN system, in the European Union and around the world as foreign ministers. So we created a network of women and we wrote to the secretary general and we've tried to, to um, write articles and be active in, in the debate also proposing different uh, actions so that we can uh, deal with these uh, challenges. I remember the financial crisis 12 years ago and there was in countries like Iceland, for example, there was a, was a big discussion around the role of, um, of women in decision making, right, coming out of the financial crisis. Is, are we going to see an equivalent coming out of COVID as we build back better? Is it, what, does the, what does building back better mean for women and, and how can yeah. we make sure that it means something? Well, yeah, what, what do these slogans mean <laughs> when, when we get back to something that uh, seems close to, to normal? It, it's very clear that we had to uh, at least build back better in the sense that things cannot be as they used to. Uh, we have to change a number of, of uh, um, parameters and, and the phenomena in, in our society. And I, yeah, I think that women will insist on, on seeing a change in, for example, how, how societies and governments deal with violence. I think they will um, ask for higher um, pay for higher salaries as they've done in my country, because they say, all right, you say that, that you are so grateful to all the women who have taken care of you in the hospitals and in daycare, uh, in schools and, and with the elderly. So then you have to, to pay up as well. You have to make sure that we have better uh, conditions. And uh, I think that that, that would be um, a good thing to rethink also how we take care of and who takes care of, of the, the elderly. So. So that is, um, but nothing will come automatically. We will have to lead such a, a, a debate. We will have to engage in such a debate and come up with some ideas about how it can be done. Um, and um, well, I, I worry about a world where we have seen um, uh, an almost frontal attack on democracy yeah. uh, and uh, sort of the, uh, the foundations of our, our democracy. We've, uh, we've seen it, uh, of course, now also in, in the US and in other countries where the autocrats have taken over. They are elected uh, autocrats and they do everything they can to stay in power. And this unfortunately has also made, created an attack on, on women's rights. Very often that's what they start by, by doing. So I'm being a bit political here, but, but clearly this is a situation that everybody can notice. Uh, and uh, I worry a lot about that. And I think it, uh, it requires also some work um, to protect uh, human rights and women's rights. Yeah, agreed. Um, another issue of the moment, I mean, IHRB has worked over the past 11 years on migrant workers and migrant worker rights. And we're aware at the moment, as we sit here, there are up to 400,000 seafarers stranded on ships around the world who have literally been there, many of them, since the beginning of the epidemic, um, who can't disembark, who can't go back to their countries of origin. Some of them are not being paid. And if we think about migrant workers beyond that, the millions and millions of South-South workers, like the, the, like the Bangladeshis in the Gulf states, etc., many of whom are stranded away from home as well. They might have lost their jobs. They're not sending remittances back to their families. Uh, many of the women, for example, are domestic workers and they're even more vulnerable there because their workplace is also their home. Um, it, it feels that our media, I don't know, know what it's like in Sweden, but certainly my country with, with Brexit and the US with the elections, that the media is 
and particularly because of COVID, has become so domestic in its focus. We, we, yes. We've become more insular, perhaps, even mm -hmm. in the past couple of years. COVID has, the lockdown has also been a lockdown in our thinking. And I see very little media coverage uh, of, of these migrants, um, yeah. you know, real, some of the most vulnerable people in relation to what's going on and the shutdown in the global economy. Um, you're it, absolutely right. I, you're, I haven't read anything about that. Yeah. I have not had anyone report sort of to to us in, in, in Sweden uh, in a comprehensive way about, about this. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I, um, I also think that, of course, by, by nature of this problem, we, I, I can understand if governments have to become sort of national because now they have to try to convince people not to travel too much. So they have to stay at home. They have to look at how does this impact our economy, our health systems and, and everything else in, in society to get that to function well. But it fits into that bigger and longer development of, of a sort of um, uh, moving away from multilateralism and, and cooperation and instead uh, insist on sort of national solutions and national a national agenda it won't help us because if if this is a proof of, of anything it is a proof of the fact how interdependent we are and uh, that these problems they know no national borders they they travel uh, around the world very very quickly and more quickly since we are global as well we we travel so so i think it's uh, it's the wrong solution to think that we can solve this uh, on our own and now the next uh, test will of course be the the vaccine uh, will we um, find it a vaccine that uh, that will actually be distributed to to every person, uh, old and young and uh, poor or rich, uh, uh, everywhere, uh, you should have the right to, to get protected. And as, as I have said also, I, I hope that we will um, uh, come to a point where we discuss what are the root causes? How come we get these uh, recurring uh, pandemics and uh, what do we do if we have a new um, variation of this uh, next year already? So, you know, we, ha we have to look at the, at the root causes. Absolutely. And if there are any journalists watching this, I mean, I think there's so many unreported stories around some of the true victims of what, what's happening around the world. But, but do we know how many they are? Is there an estimate of how many um they are around the world well, we know on the ships it's up to four hundred thousand seafarers in terms of migrants i mean there are literally millions of 20 30 uh 40 50 million um migrant workers um how many of those are stranded because of 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 of, of the inability to get their passports or pay for return fares um or pay the recruitment fees that they paid up front um, we know it's millions. We don't, Margaret. We don't have a precise number on that. Um, that's mm -hmm. part of the problem. A lot of times, these people are victims and are invisible. But we know through our networks of migrant NGOs around the world that this is a huge issue, and they're mm -hmm. trying to establish a foundation or some kind of fund, a relief fund, that could at least get money to some of these people and either families in countries of origin or or the stranded workers abroad just to keep people you know, eating, because right. oftentimes these people have no recourse to social security in the countries where they, where they are working, right? They're, they have a very, some of the times they have very limited rights. So um, it's, it's a huge priority for us and many organizations, trade unions, NGOs, and even businesses, right? That, that are working together through our leadership group on responsible recruitment to, to try and work on this issue. But we're very pleased to have you working with us on that now. And another set of issues that have received a lot more attention over recent years here are issues like Me Too, like Black Lives Matters, um, uh, like LGBTI rights that, um, that have come along, you know, since you were last on our advisory council. Mm -hmm. I know these are not new issues for you, but they suddenly 
particularly Me Too, you know, you know, suddenly came to the global consciousness uh, three years mm -hmm. ago. Are we, do you see an interconnection between these different issues? Is this a trend? Is this some sort of social consciousness or are these just completely different issues being driven for different re reasons in different places around the world? No, I think they are interconnected in that it is a rising uh, level of, of awareness of, of these things. And also we have more of identity politics as well, which can be both good and bad. Um, but um, it is also, um, it's a positive thing because we start to reflect on, so what, what does human rights mean? Yeah. Uh, are they universal and, and how are they to be implemented uh, in the specific case and also to have to deal with, with a history that, that is often rather dark and, and sad uh, and realize that this is um, the truth about our own, our own national history or, or uh, world history and we have to uh, learn from it, we have to understand it. And, um, but it has become increasingly um, difficult and hard to, to work on, on human rights as well. We can see it in the Human Rights Council in Geneva, we can see it uh, uh, everywhere and, uh, and people start to, to interpret this as not being universal rights, but something that you can shape uh, um, within your own borders. And, so this is um, a very important and, and timely debate as well. Important for us at the Institute to see what, uh, how we can co contribute also. Yes, and, 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 and thinking back to your time within the European Commission, next year we're expecting to see some European Commission proposals on mandatory human rights due diligence for business and, and mandatory environmental and climate change due diligence for business. Um, which has long been coming, but, but it seems now that some of the legislation we've seen in France and, um, and it's being discussed in places like Switzerland, the modern slavery legislation in countries like the UK and Australia, that, 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 that some of this is beginning to tighten up now, and become a bit more binding, a uh, stronger expectation of business to perform on social and environmental issues mm -hmm. as much as business needs to perform on financial issues. Now, do yeah. you see, because of everything we've been talking about in the past half hour, do you, do you think there's a fundamental shift coming? Uh, I, I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> I, 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 what are thinking, Margaret? Are we just, when we look at ESG and all these other things, are we looking into the glass uh, or the tea leaves and seeing the patterns that we want to see there? Or do you really think something's happening? No, I don't think anything happens without a, a, a struggle. Uh, it won't happen without organizations like our institute or, or other human rights defenders around the world if they had not made us fully aware of, 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 of all of this, uh, nothing would have happened. And uh, I think we should um, also thank, of, of course, somebody like John Ruggie who, who has <laughs> been uh, so, so in, important. Uh, um, and, uh, and knowing fully well that the, the time was not ripe for uh, introducing this as binding, uh, but rather recommendations and you, you start by that. But today we also have to deal with a much more um, individualistic uh, uh, sort of capitalist <laughs> money making, uh, machinery around the world so you have to um, you have to counter that with with this type of uh, of, um, of rules um, they, they have to be binding don't don't you see it the same way absolutely no no, yeah. no no I think without a doubt and I what's interesting is incre increasing numbers of businesses also feel that they these rules have to be binding um, mm. because yeah. Uh, there are many around the world, um, in, including in our own countries, that will cut corners. And we're seeing yeah. this in trade discussions at the moment in the UK, UK's trade negotiations with Europe, but also at the same time starting to talk to the US. And what's interesting in, 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 you know, in the UK is that we have farmers 
driving their tractors, you know, on protests over the past couple of weeks because they don't want to be undercut by mm. less less environmental standards and less health. No, exactly. And you you know that we defend very strongly the system that we have uh, in Sweden and in in Nordic countries uh, with collective bargaining and and very strong trade unions. Um, and they have always been well organized and they negotiate uh, the level of salaries and, and all the conditions. And right now we are having a, a very lively debate about uh, changes to the existing legislation and to, to, this, uh, to this system of, of um, having negotiated uh, uh, deals. Uh, and uh, I, I think we have to be I think we have to defend also this uh, and care more about the system that, that we have because it has brought uh, peace on the labor market. I mean, we have very few strikes or, or sort of demonstrations uh, in, in with our system. And also we've had constant um, uh, rise of, of pay uh, or, and salaries over the years. So it has brought um, something both to the employers and the employees, yeah. uh, and and I think any system that uh, that um, uh, produces that uh, we should uh, take care of. Uh, so um, we are, but we are at a point where they say, well, modern. You have to modernize this system. You have to to do this or that. It has to be easier to f to fire people, uh, and maybe easier to hire them as as well. Um, but there is always a line to draw there, and there is a balance to maintain, and I think this is what the debate is really about. Absolutely. All right. So moving to, 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 to a couple of my last questions really is about IHRB's work as it's emerging, and it's, I don't want to be unfair on you because you're, you're new, you're just coming in as chair, but I think one of the first times I met you, I was thinking about that this morning, was in 2003, you'd been talking to companies on climate change issues as part of your yeah. role as EU Environment Commissioner. And uh, we brought together Mary Robinson and some other companies to say, well, could we not do the same on human rights? Could there not be a, you know, just to, before, even before John Ruggie started his mandate, could at least a number of companies look at this in a positive way and not just throw the lawyers at the conversation? Um, what I like now, actually, is that the climate and human rights conversations are coming together again. Um, they're, they're certainly coming together in the, the, the legal sense around due diligence, but also accountability. Um, the Paris Climate Agreement makes reference to the concept of just transition. Yeah. And when we talk to the International Trade Union Confederation and others about what that means, and so we are, you know, workers are at the center of it, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this idea that to, to make the changes we need to make in the, the next few years to meet our Paris commitments and to reach net zero, obviously there has to be quite a dramatic radical shift in, 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 in the portfolio of business and, and the energy that businesses use. And that can be quite traumatic for local populations and workers. And we've mm. seen Europe and all parts of the world that if, if, if in a post-industrial context, if workers are just stranded, they will get desperate themselves. And, and, and a lot of populist politicians, of course, have uh, drawn on that support to make promises. So the transition, bringing everyone with us in, in an environmental process is a social issue and it's about workers. And we would say it's about the human rights of everybody affected by business operations. Um, what, how do we make that happen? It just seems such, as we enter into it, Margot, and I'm just thinking in the European context, you know, coal mines in Spain and Poland and other places that are, you know, well, Colombian coal uh, might no longer be fueling power stations in the Netherlands and Germany. It's such a shift. Do you have a vision? Can we really make it happen? Can we really bring people with us on this environmental journey? Or are we going to mm. ghettoize uh, communities and, 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 and you know, who, who lose well-paying jobs? No, this is what I find the most fashion fascinating right now with the, the work of, of uh, this institute and uh, the, the IHRB. And I really like the I like the, the mission statement <laughs> of the institute. <laughs> I think that this is this no, but it's it's excellent. It, every business understood 
how its actions could undermine respect for human rights and took proactive steps to prevent their impacts, the world would be a different place. Responsible business uh, prevents potential harms, ensures accountability, accountability and delivers lasting value. Isn't that, that's a wonderful way of, of describing it. But of course you have to break it down. And I think with the help of Mary Robinson, because she was uh, maybe the first to speak about climate justice, to make the, the link between climate change and, and uh, adapting to, to, to climate change. Um, and at the same time, ensure that, that people can enjoy human rights. That is really the, 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 the challenge and we, we just have to do it. But I think we have to provide some good pilot projects that, that will show how it can be done uh, sort of in, on the ground or in a particular uh, situation. But without that, we will leave people, of course, questioning the whole climate change uh, science and, and uh, uh, practice as, as well. So uh, we um, and we have to work with governments also to to tell them that this is a, a, a good thing to engage in such a, a plan uh, for for just uh, transition. Well, I look forward to that. And the other new program uh, we've started is on the built environment with, with actually quite a few partners in Scandinavia with the RAFTO uh, Foundation in Norway, the Raoul Wallenberg Institute in Sweden, the Danish Institute for Human Rights are good friends of ours um, as well. And I'm just thinking, why, why is there a, is this, does Scandinavia still have something very special it's giving to the world here? Why is it that it's the mayors of cities and towns in Scandinavia that are thinking about human rights at the very local level and are also thinking about building back better in their own mm -hmm municipalities. Why, why, well, why is it that we see this in Scandinavia and not so much elsewhere? What's going, you still got the secret thing. Yeah, I don't know. We, I think we, we, are, we are well educated. I think we live in societies where you have, um, in societies that are democracies, um, where you are sort of respected in, in your own right. And you also expect something from, from the, your leaders, from your government, also from your local community that they, they must um, br bring something uh, to you or back to you. And I, I also, this is the reality we live in that most people today live in big cities and that sort of concentration to, to big cities will, will continue. So you have to ensure that you can find everything you need also in your in your city or in your uh, living uh, environment and um, uh, this is um, this is exciting and it's good I think also on, on climate change they have been uh, very good you have to build sustainable cities um, where where all your needs are are met and um, that is um, an enormous um, a formidable task <laughs> to uh, to build back better also from that point of view well thanks for your time i'm very much hopeful that next year 2021 we might actually have an international advisory council meeting in person <laughs> i can, hope so too I hope so. <laughs> we can all get together um uh, hopefully for a few days you know a, a good amount of time to really think this stuff through um i'm glad not only have you rejoined our board, but it's clear from what you've said that you still have faith in the business and human rights movement to 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 add value. Um, Absolutely, so. I'm proud and happy to have been asked um, to to chair your advisory council, and uh, I still think that this is a worthy cause and uh, it's a good way to. Uh, to spend um, the time that I have when I have fed the chickens uh, <laughs> to <laughs> and I really hope that one day we'll be able to meet in person. Yes, so thank you Margot, thank you to your chickens for sparing you for a while and, and, and the bees that are probably sleeping uh, somewhere safely I hope at the moment. I think. Um, Take care now and stay you, safe thanks. and see you soon again. <laughs>
Bye. Bye. <laughs>